Good morning, Emmanuel. As always, it's a joy to get this opportunity just to open up God's Word with you and continue um, just moving through the book of Isaiah. And I don't know about you, but I have been just deeply encouraged. Isaiah was always one of those books that I was like, man, I have never really read it all the way through, just have not spent a lot of time in it. And the Lord said, I'm going to fix that. And uh, I'm going to fix that by you preaching through it with uh, your co-pastors. And so it's just been such a sweet uh, encouragement to my soul as I have had to open up this book uh, week by week and study it and be fed by it. And so if you have your Bibles, you can open up to the book of Isaiah. Uh, Chapter 49 is where we're going to be. And I'll read the whole chapter. But before I read, I just I want to I want to kind of set the stage and kind of give you uh, I forgot I had this this lapel on. I want to give you uh, just a, a background a little bit of something that I want you to notice and understand from this text. And what I want you to see and hear and be encouraged by is that what we're about to read is God comforting his people. If I could maybe summarize what God is doing in this section, it would be found in verse 13 at the very end of it, in which, uh, in which God says this, or the word says this, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. And so what we're about to read is being given to Israel, is being spoken to them as a means of comfort. God has told them that he's going to punish them because of their sin. He's going to send them out of the land and they will be captive by uh, pagan nations. And, 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 and we've just seen week after week the depths of Israel's sin and God condemning them for their sin. And, and then he's been talking in the last couple of chapters but from 40 until 48 of how he's going to deliver them from that exile and bring them back into the land. And so 49 picks up with God saying, hey, though I'm going to punish you, though exile is coming, I'm going to bring you back into the land and I'm going to even do something more glorious than just bringing you back here. I'm going to bring full and complete salvation through my servant. And so I just pray that this this passage, as we look at Israel and begin to apply it to our lives, we would just be comforted by the God who is just and will discipline and does hate sin, but he has made a way that he can show sinners comfort and compassion through his servant. And so let's read, starting in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1. Listen to me, O coastlands. And give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. And he made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But but I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity, yet surely my right is with the Lord, my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to his servant to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He has said, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Judah and to bring back the preserved of Israel, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out to those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways. On all the bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst. Neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. 
For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highway shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Syene. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste go out from you. Lift up your eyes around and see. They all gather, they come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall put them on as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does. Surely your waste and your desolate places and your devastated land, surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants, and those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, this place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell in. Then you shall say in your heart, who has borne me these? Who I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But, but, but who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. From where have these come? Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples. And they shall bring your sons in, in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Can the prey be taken from the mighty, or the captives from a tyrant be rescued? For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with wine. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce? with which I send her away, or which of my creditors, creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke I dry up the sea, I make the rivers a desert, their fish, fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. Let's pray. Father, so much to take in, so much to think through, and yet such a glorious word. And so I pray that you would give me grace to speak clearly, to speak simply. I pray that through me you would minister comfort to your people as they see the beauty of Christ your servant and as they see your compassion towards sinful Israel. God, would you grant us fresh, fresh conviction, fresh repentance? Would you warm and uplift our hearts with the glory of the salvation that you have worked through Christ? And I ask that you would do these things for your glory. Give us your spirit now and help us, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. This passage has a lot of moving parts, and uh, it, was, it was quite a, a, a difficult passage to work through just because it's so long, but, it, but it's actually, once you begin to really get in, it's actually pretty simple. And so I have two points that I want to set before you today. The first point is that God comforts through the sending of his servant. As we work through this passage, you're going to see that God is going to comfort Israel through the sending of of his servant. And then the second point that I want you to see uh, is God comforts through dealing graciously with Zion. And so the first point can be found in verses 1 through 13, 
And then really 14 through uh, chapter 50, verse 3, is that second point that God comforts through dealing graciously with Zion. And I love this passage because notice how it opens up. Notice as Pastor Ryan and, and Pastor Jeff has, has shown us, oftentimes when, when the writer speaks, he, he, he calls people to listen. So if you were to jump back to chapter 48, verse 1, you would see, hear this, O house of Jacob. And then again in verse 12 of chapter 48, listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, whom I called. And so you have this reality where God is calling to Israel, calling to his people, saying, listen to me. I have something that you need to hear and that you need to know. But our passage does something strikingly different. You see, if you, if you pay close attention, the one who's speaking, though it's being spoken through Isaiah, it isn't God the Father. Ryan, Pastor Ryan pointed out last week a little small verse in 48 chapter 16 at the very end where it says, the Lord God has sent me with his spirit. And it's just this random little phrase, but it's clear that somebody else is speaking. And here in chapter 49, that somebody else steps completely to the forefront. And notice that he doesn't say, thus says the Lord. He himself calls the coastlands and the islands to listen because he himself has authority to speak and to reject him is to reject God. And so whoever this is that is speaking, he calls them to listen to him. I was uh, at a college ministry uh, one, uh, last Thursday and somebody asked me, they were like, is Christ in the Old Testament? Well, right here, you have one of the clearest evidences that Jesus is not only in the Old Testament, but he is speaking to God's Old Testament people as the eternal son with all glory and authority. He is speaking. And so in these next six verses, this is Christ speaking to us, to Israel, on his own behalf. And let's see what he says. He says, listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. So this message isn't just for the Jews. It's for the whole world. And then he goes on to do something very interesting. He goes on to speak about who he is and his calling as a person. He goes on to remind them and share with them, this is who it is that speaks to you. And there are five things that I, I want to show you that Jesus says about himself. Five ways that God is going to comfort Israel by reminding them of who the Savior is. And so in verse 1, we see his appointment. Notice what he says, I was called from the womb, from the body of my mother, I was, the Lord named me. And, and this, this idea, it isn't just simply, oh, uh, somebody's coming and his name's going to be Johnny or Jim. It isn't just like the random naming of, of a baby, as important as that is. When Jesus is saying, I was named from my birth, he's saying, not only did I get a name, but that name was attached to a title and a mission. Does anybody know in the New Testament where we, we get Jesus' name. Can anybody shout out the verse really quick? Let's see. Anybody got it? Where Mary is told what Jesus' name will be. Matthew? Matthew? Close. Matthew 1. It's also in Luke 31. But an angel of the Lord comes to Mary and Joseph and says, basically he comes to Joseph actually and says, Mary is with child and, and don't leave her because it is from me and you shall name his, his, his name Jesus and he will save the people from their sins. 
And so what this servant is saying is that when I gave my name, it wasn't just like, oh, Mary and Joseph, you know, they had a long list of baby names. What should we call them? Or we're going to have a gender reveal. No, before Christ was ever born, when he is being knit together in his mother's womb, it has already been determined that his name will be Jesus. And the significance of that name is that that name will be the name that will save people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And so before he ever utters his first cry, his life and his mission has already been clearly spoken and ordained by God. This is a unique servant. In verse 2, we see his preparation. Notice what the text says. It says, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. So whoever whoever this servant is, his words will pierce and they will cut and they're like a sharp sword. And then it goes on. He made me a polished arrow. An arrow, it's, it's just waiting to be slung and shot. But then notice what else it says. I love this. And in both cases, it said he hid me away. Does that bring to memory anything in the New Testament? Was not Jesus born and then for 30 years he was hidden away? When when, when Herod tried to kill him, he was sent down to Egypt, hidden and protected. And then when the time was right, he was brought back, hidden and protected. And for 30 years, he worked among the people whom he created as a carpenter. Nobody really knew him. There was nothing special about him. Just this guy doing carpentry for 30 years. And yet he is the sharpened sword, the pointy arrow that be the, be the one who will redeem all people. And so God is preparing him and hiding him for that time when he would burst on the stage as the redeemer of all. Verse three, we see his identity. This one's kind of interesting because because you got to really think about what is being said here. It says, and he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. And you need a little, a little background and, and Old Testament Bible knowledge to understand what's, what's being said here. The first thing that isn't being said is he isn't saying that this is Israel, the sinful people that he's been referencing in all of Isaiah. And we know this because if you look down in verse 5, it says that whoever this, this is, is going to lead Israel back to God. And so simply put, Israel can't lead Israel to God. That's Israel's problem. They keep running from God. And so whoever this is being called Israel, that's going to lead God's sinful people back to him, has to be distinct. And so what's going on here? Well, I think what's going on here is Christ is being portrayed as the epitome, as the embodiment of all that Israel was supposed to be. If you remember in places like Exodus chapter 4 and Exodus chapters 19, Israel is called the firstborn of God. And Israel's mission is to be a priesthood of people who would be a beacon to the nations, that the nations would see Israel, and through Israel they would come to know the one and true God. And if you know anything about your Bible, Israel has done the exact opposite. Instead of bringing the nations to God, they have whored after the gods of the nations. Instead of being a witness that there is only one God, they have jumped in the pool of debauchery and idolatry. And so who is the identity of this Savior? He's the true Israel. The the, the one who perfectly glorifies God, the image of the invisible God, the one who perfectly obeys God and does all that God had intended for him to do as the true firstborn. It is this Israel that will bring redemption to physical Israel. And so who is this identity? He's he's the one that brings all of humanity to God, the true firstborn, the true Israel. The fourth thing that it teaches us in verse 4, his discouragement and trust. And you're like, man, that's crazy. 
Jesus was actually discouraged. Notice what the text says. Just after in verse 3, but he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I am glorified. The servant responds, but I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. And yet notice that though he, he, he expresses how he feels, he reassures himself in truth. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my reward is with my God. And so what's going on here? We know that Jesus was fully God and is fully man. And as a man with an earthly ministry, he had to learn how to trust God even when things didn't go the way he may have thought they would have gone. And when you think about Jesus, the only person who ever preached perfect sermons, the one who did millions, not millions, but many, many miracles and healed people and did glorious things. And yet so few believed in him. Contrast that to, let's say, Pentecost, where Peter preaches one sermon and thousands come to know the Lord. And you can imagine you're the God of the universe telling everybody, you who are, who are weary and heavy laden, come to me, and no one comes, save a few. And you can imagine how that would weigh on your heart and your mind. And being discouraged is not a sin. Unbelief is a sin. And so though he was discouraged, he reaffirms himself in truth. Though he affirms how hard things are and how he wishes they were different, he still trusts the Lord. And this is actually not the only time that we see this in the scriptures. If you were to look at, for instance, uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, what does he say? You got it. What does is, what is he utter? I'll wait. How does he feel? What does he, what, what he acknowledge that seems to have happened? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In some mysterious way, as the sin bearer, God did have to turn his head on the beautiful one. And yet on that cross, as Jesus feels lonely and forsaken, you actually have to jump to another passage in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And you see where Jesus, again, trusts in the Lord. Because what does he say there? Into your hand, I commit my spirit. Though I feel forsaken, though I feel like you've left me, when he takes his dying breath, he recognizes that I give my spirit to you, Father. I trust in you, Father. You see it again in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is going to pray. Lord, if there's any way you can remove this cup, would you take it for me? I, I don't want to endure this and yet trust. Yet not my will, but thy will be done. All of these things point to Jesus himself as a man, as he walked this earth, experienced trial and discomfort and discouragement. And yet in every instance, he perfectly takes those trials and that discomfort and that discouragement, and he trusts God the Father. And I, I just want to stop and just say, for the parents who've been praying for years for your children, and it's not going the way you thought it would go, and you're like, what is happening? You can trust and take that to the Father. For those who have been praying for parents or spouses, or you've been in ministry and you've been saying the same thing to this person and they will not repent and they will not turn. You can trust that though it may not be looking the way you would like it to look, God is in control. And what has to happen right there is instead of being mad at him because you haven't got the outcome that you want, you're called to press into him saying, my life is in your hands, Abba. You've got this. You can do this. And I will trust you no matter what. And so what a, what a gift 
that we have the Savior struggling and yet perfectly trusting the Lord. And here, here's something I've been musing on. Um, throughout Jesus' ministry, we see him often quote Isaiah. And I just wonder if in the providence of God, these verses that were written hundreds of years before the man, the God-man walked the earth, might have even been God's comfort to his own son to say, though you will suffer, though it will be hard, I've got you. And so Jesus would have read these words and taken comfort that just says, no, it, does, it doesn't look good right now, but I know what my father has spoken and these things will happen. It's just something to think about. The fifth thing we, that we see in verses 1 through 13 is the salvation, the salvation that the servant brings. It says in, in verse 5, and now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord. My God has become my strength. Notice what God says to him. Verse 6, he says, God says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. I love this. You want to know the worth of Jesus Christ? He's so glorious that to simply save Israel is not enough glory for him. And so God says, it's, it's not enough that you would just serve, save Israel. I'm, I'm going to so glorify you that you will be the savior of all of humanity, of all who trust in you. You will save them from their sins. You, you want to think about the worth of Jesus? He's so worthy that God had to bring other sinners into the fold to show the glory and sufficiency of his blood and his salvation. This is the glory of Christ. This is the servant that is being set before the people of Israel to say, I, I want to comfort you by letting you know that I'm not just going to bring you back from exile. I'm going to send this servant to come and live and die for you. And so in verses 1 through 6, we see this reality of who the servant is in his person. But in verses 7 through 13, we begin to see how the servant will work. What is his work? Notice verse, verse 7 of chapter 49 serves as a bit of a transition. He says, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. And I love this because it, it serves as a transition between these two sections. But, but does it not describe Jesus perfectly? He was abhorred and despised. He was rejected by many. And yet there will come a day where kings will prostrate at his feet. It makes me think of Philippians chapter 2 where it says that, that he being found in, in human form, he humbled himself by becoming a servant, by becoming a servant even to the point of death on the cross. And then what does it say? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. What name is that? So that the name of Jesus, every name in heaven and on earth and under the earth will pray, give glory to God. I, I totally butch that, but... But you get my point. Jesus was humbled and despised and rejected. But when he got up from that cross and on the last day, he will be worshipped by every knee and every tongue. He will be worshipped by all. That is his work, the work of redemption. And so verses 7 through 13 continue to spell out this redemption of Jesus in a time of favor, I have answered you. And at a day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to his people. And for the sake of time, I can't go through each verse, but I just want to highlight. God says, I will give you as a covenant to my people. What a sweet 
foretaste of what is to come. Beloved, Jesus is the new covenant. And God has given him as a covenant to the people to say, no longer will my people relate to me through their obedience to the law, but now they will relate to me through the covenant keeper, the one who has perfectly obeyed and laid down his life so that now through faith, sinners can have access to a holy God. God will give this servant as a new covenant, a perfect covenant, to his people. The second point, God comforts through his encouragement and speaking graciously to Zion. There are many ways you could divide up this next section, but I thought it was just easiest to divide it up. As you'll see, this section is really a dialogue of questions and answers. And so if you can imagine sinful Israel, they always just have to show themselves. And so God has just been talking about this glorious redemption, a redemption that we see in verse 13 has all of the cosmos in praise, worshiping God because of this salvation that he's done. And instead of jumping into the, to the applause, Zion says, what about me? Notice verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. And to be clear, there's, a, there, there's, there's some legitimacy to that question. It isn't just them being foolish. Think about this. You've just read that God is going to bring the nations back to the land. God is going to bring in the nations. He's going to save all of these people. And here Zion is being portrayed as, 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 as a person. Jerusalem is being portrayed as a person, and, and though the nations are coming back, there's very little said about what will happen with Jerusalem. And so you can imagine in Jerusalem, this is where the temple is. This is, this is the city of David, the people where, the place where people once a year, they come for the Passover. This is where God's glory was, be, was, was, was dwelling in their day. And so it's a valid question to say, but what about Jerusalem? What about Zion? What are you going to do? And, and notice how God responds. He could rebuke them, but notice the gentleness and the graciousness with which he responds to Zion. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child that you should have no compassion, that, that she should have no compassion on the son of her, of her womb? So he asked this question, can a woman who has a child just forget that child? And in most cases, the answer would be no. A mother who has a child wouldn't just leave that child. And yet I love the wisdom of the Bible and God because he knows we live in a broken world. And so he says, even if that were the case, I won't do that. I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. And then God asked another question. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your, your walls are continually before me. And so he's telling them, I know, I know your walls. Like I, when I look at my hands, I'm reminded of you. I shall never forget you. And think about this, beloved. Here is this sinful people who have continually rebelled against God. And even now they have the audacity when he's talking about his glorious salvation to say, what about us? And God leans in and says, I, I haven't forgotten you. And all the way from verse 15 to 21, God is just giving them assurance after assurance. People will come back. I have not forgot you. The people will return. They, the places that are desolate will be sprawling with people. And again, I, I just want to pause because this is a great comfort for us. Beloved, if this is God's response to Israel, who constantly turned from him and ran from him and established other idols... Don't you realize that you can be comforted as you stumble along as an imperfect Christian? As you think about all the ways that you have failed 
and sinned against God and you're tempted to flee from his presence, this comes to you and says, I have not forgotten you. There is nothing, nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so if God can speak gently and graciously with sinful Israel, how much more can he spend, spend, speak graciously and kindly to you, the imperfect Christian? And so what a motivation that we have to be reminded that God will never leave us or forsake us. Or as the scripture says, those who wait on the Lord will never be put to shame. And so the first question that we see is in verse 14. The next question is in verse 21. Look at verse 21. He says, then you will say in my heart, who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away, but who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone from where have they come? In other words, God is saying there is going to be such a return of people flowing to Zion that you're going to look around and say, where did they come from? What has happened? It's kind of like if you leave Emmanuel for two or three years and then you come back and you just see the family of one now has three. I don't know how that happens in two years, but it just happened. Where have they come from? What has happened? That, that is what Zion will be saying, and notice God's response. This is glorious. He says in verse 22, thus says the Lord, where will they come from? Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their arms, and your daughter should be carried on their shoulders. Where will they come from? I'm going to speak the word, and I'm going to raise a banner, and every nation that has my people in it will give them up, and they won't simply give them up. They will bring them on their shoulders, and they will carry them in their arms. Is that not what God did through Cyrus, bringing them back? As you read Nehemiah, and he's, he's getting money and resources from an unbelieving king, is that the, not the reality that we've seen in the scriptures? And in a greater way, is that not the reality that we see in King Jesus when he is snatching people from every tribe and tongue and nation to worship God? And then you have another question. It's, it, it makes sense. Verse 24, can, can, can the prey be snatched, be taken away from the mighty or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? In other words, man, these, these kings, man, they are some strong dudes. Like, what does that look like? Again, it would be like, Israel, come on, bro. Like, get it together. God has already shown you. And yet, how does God respond? He responds by saying this. For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken and the prey of the tyrant rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you and I will save your children. In other words, those who don't give up my children, I will destroy. How do you know that I can do, the, 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 the prey can be snatched from the mighty? Because I'm the one who can destroy the mighty. I'm the one who can destroy your enemies. And so what a comfort to know God's amazing power to redeem. And then as he ends this, God kind of gives one final answer in verses 50, uh, chapters, verses 1 through 3. There's this question that, that's kind of almost uh, been asked about, okay, like, Lord, like, okay, but why did you leave us in the first place? And he says, thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to, to whom I have sold her? In other words... There is no certificate of divorce, so I, I never divorced her. I never left her. Which creditor did I sell her to? And then he goes on to say, and where were you when I called? The reason why you were sold, the reason why you went into bondage is because of your sin. It wasn't because of me, it was because of you. And then he ends this section by declaring his glorious might. Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeemed? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. 
And so in other words, though you were sold because of your own sin, you will be redeemed because of my power and graciousness. Though you left me, I never left you. And I'm going to go through hell and high water to get you back. And I will send my servant to redeem you. And so I know that's a lot to process. And so what I want to do is just leave you with two points of application. Two truths that we, as we see this glorious servant who has come to redeem us, who's come to live and be our new covenant and die so that we don't have to pay the penalty for our sins, so that now we can come to God, not through obedience to the law, but through faith in the perfect law keeper. Two truths that I want to set before you. The first one is this, is that God's ways are not our ways. And he strengthens through suffering, and he, and he, he builds trust through trial. And so what I mean by that is invariably, if you live this Christian life long enough, there will be some things in your life that, as Pastor Jeff said, you, you wouldn't write those into your life. There will be some trials and some hardships that will test you. But remember the words of 1 Peter chapter 1, that your faith is being refined by fire. And just as Jesus wouldn't have wrote the story the way it was written, so too would you not write your story the way it was written. And just as Jesus dealt with discomfort and had to trust the Lord, he had to learn trust. The Bible says he learned obedience through what he suffered. He had to learn moment by moment. This is what it looks like to give this to the Lord. This is what it looks like to trust him in this circumstance. Beloved, a servant is not, is not better than his master. And if Jesus had to endure these trials and hardships and entrust them to the Lord, so too will you. And so hear this, believer. When the bottom falls out and life is rough, when you get that kid that you didn't plan on, when you lose that job, when, when friends and families leave you, that doesn't mean things are going wrong. That means God is refining your faith and giving you another opportunity to experience his love and his grace and his power and his comfort to us as sinners. And so often we're trying to get comfortable again. We're trying to get out of this situation and, and work this out when instead God is just saying, trust me, press into me, I've got you. I know your beginning and I know your end and there is nothing that comes into your life apart from me allowing it to do so and I allow it to do so so that I can teach you more about myself and so we can trust him. The second thing I want to leave you with is that God remains faithful even when we waver. And sometimes as Christians, we don't know what to do with doubt. And what I want to explain to you and make clear to you is that there are actually two types of doubt in the Bible. There's a doubt that comes from a wicked and unbelieving heart. I just refuse to trust and believe in God. And then there's a doubt of a weak faith that's reached its limits and is in the process of being stretched. Beloved, God has a place for your weak faith. No one in here is saved because you just have strong faith. All faith is weak, and all Christians will struggle. And in those moments, what God wants you to do with that doubt and that struggle is to come to him. Israel, what about us, God? Can, can you, do you really have the strength? Can you really do this? And at every time, God is like, hey, I've got you. Let me, let me tell you one more thing about myself. I've got this power. I can do these things. And so, beloved, when you're wrestling with doubt, don't, don't be a super Christian. The Bible never calls you just to swallow it and muster it up. The Bible teaches us to pray, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I know you're good, but in the moment I'm struggling to trust your goodness. 
Lord, I know you're faithful and I can't see the end of this, but would you keep me and protect me? Would you cause me? Would you help me not to fall away? I love you. I don't want to turn from you, but Lord, I need your help. That is the cry of the believer. The doubt that the Bible never gives us credence for is the doubt that says, oh God, you don't have power. I don't even want to believe you have power. Oh no, you're not good. You're not, if, you, if you were good, what, what is that? That is sinful unbelief. And so may God give us grace to press into him with our doubts and our hurts and our questions, knowing that our God can handle them. And may he give us wisdom to repent from all ungodly belief. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for your servant who is a covenant to your people. He is our righteousness. He is our wisdom. He is our redemption and our sanctification. And I pray that you would help all of us to continue to look to King Jesus, the one who has lived and bled and died for our sins. I thank you because even as we look at this word, as, we, as we're reminded that Jesus was sent to a light as a light for the Gentiles, God, we are here as Christians because you have answered this prophecy. We, we are here as the fulfillment of the very words we have just read on the page. Jesus, you have become our light and you have given us light and brought us from, from darkness and we praise you for that. And yet, God, we are a weak people who have many doubts and many struggles. And would you help us to run to you and not from you in the midst of these hardships and these trials? Lord, I thank you for your word that you did this perfectly, and yet you learned obedience through which you suffered. As we look to you, would you teach us to learn obedience as we suffer? And we ask these things in your name. Amen.